Every year, uh, the first week of May, uh, the three clinical societies, uh, the American Society for Clinical Investigation, uh, the American Association of Physicians, and the uh, American Federation for Clinical Research met in Atlantic City. On the Sunday of that meeting, Sunday night, there was a meeting of what was then known as the Blood Club. And there would be presented uh, papers uh, more or less review papers, reviewing the current status of a particular field, whether it was uh, sickle cell anemia, thrombocytopenia, aplastic anemia, and so on. Uh, Damashek got a group of people together and said, we should have a national organization um, uh, and we should convert this uh, yearly blood club uh, which is um, for the members of the three clinical societies, we should convert that into a national organization and it should be called the American Society of Hematology. It finally came about in 1958. That was uh, the first meeting and now it's 50 years later, uh, 2008. It's hard to believe that 50 years have gone by with such amazing uh, speed. The first meeting, the organizational meeting, I still remember well, was on April 7th in 1957 in one room <clears throat> at the Harvard Club in Boston. I don't think there were more than 40 or 50 people there. Uh, the morning was taken over with or discussion of what the organization of the, of the society should be, whether it should be inclusive or exclusive. It wasn't exclusive. You didn't have to have published 10 great papers before you could get in. And I thought, yeah, that's great. You just, you just come because you're interested. At first they said all you had to do was have one paper in which you were an author on a, on a publication and you could go in. And we abolished that after a while. It says, everybody's welcome, you don't have to paper. It did not have this system in which a few people sitting around a table decide who will be members next year. You know, we think we are the finest young people in American medicine. Well, how'd you get that way? Well, we elected ourselves, Guy said, it's a tribal meritocracy. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and it wasn't that way. It included people from pediatrics, people from pathology, people who were technicians. And I thought that was much better than this business of, of having a, a group of people who decided that they are the future of medicine. The good thing about ASH when it started was that it was small. Dr. Carl Moore was sort of chairing the meeting. He said at that, at that meeting, that the main purpose of the ASH, the, the, the new society, was to give one good scientific meeting a year. That was all. And I said, yeah, that's right. Was I wrong? <laughs> As a medical student, I became very interested in Do Dr. Damashek, who was really the person who started the American Society of Hem Hematology. I used to go down on Saturday morning and make rounds with him when, when I was still a student. I remember distinctly his grand rounds, ITP, and uh, he, not, not only did he describe the disease, how you make the diagnosis, but in the last 15 minutes or so, he speculated on the mechanism and the origins of this disease. He was a powerful, intuitive thinker and he thought about his patients. He wasn't a laboratory man. He was a clinician who thought about his patients. And it was his thinking about patients with polycythemia vera and related diseases that led him to conclude that there must be a tie bringing together these different diseases and now we know what it is. It's the JAK2 mutation. Well, the great man was William Castle. He may have been boring set running the course when I took it, but he was the greatest uh, man in terms of his incredible ability to size up a patient and with simple methods 
figure out what was wrong and what you might be able to do about it. I mean, I have never, never saw anything like it. He's the smartest man I've ever met, also one of the nicest, most modest, incredibly influential person in, uh, in hematology. <clears throat> he was my chair and, and uh, the person I looked up to and have ever since then. He died many years ago, but he has stayed as father figure in hematology in my life. Undoubtedly, the, the, my major mentor was Clem Finch. Uh, I had my first year of hematology training under Dr. Finch. A great physiologist, a great student of iron metabolism, he could take facts from different disciplines and figure out how they were connected like no one I've ever met. Every patient was in Clem's mind, uh, if not an experiment, every patient was someone that you could learn from and someone that you could begin to formulate ideas around. In, in many ways, he towered over us because of, of just what he was able to do, how he thought, um, the research that he did. I mean, he brought our, our understanding of iron metabolism right up to the edge of the era of molecular biology. Hale made major contributions both as a clinical investigator and then as an organizer in, in getting the, in the hematology society initiated. Um, he, he started his own academic career in, at the Thorndike in Boston in the early 30s with uh, <clears throat> the wonderful Bill Castle, who indeed was Hale's mentor, uh, just as Hale was mine. And uh, his first paper was with Castle on, on uh, the role of extrinsic factor in pernicious anemia. But I think he was really best known for his studies in hemolytic anemias and uh, the description uh, of what others called and still call the ham test, although which Hale would never, uh, never claim because of his modesty, uh, a, a diagnostic test for paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Hale was, uh, as I look back, was the ideal mentor. He always insisted that one's, that a, a good mentor ought to be one's strongest advocate and severest critic. I was a fellow here in hematology um, at Mount Sinai starting in 1974. And at that point, Dr. Wasburn was the senior person in the department. So at the same time I was doing research, I was doing stem cell research in the laboratory. So we would talk about that and you know, we would talk about the clinical uh, problems that we faced and one day he, we were walking in the hospital and he looked at me and said, you know, I really want you to understand that real hematologists, the great hematologists, those great hematologists study polycythemia vera. And I said, well, why is that? He says, well, first of all, because you can learn about the bone marrow and you can learn about um, clotting and you can learn about uh, red cells and you can learn about white cells. So basically polycythemia vera, which is the, the disease that he was really known for, um, can be a research foundation or basis to learn an awful lot about um, many, many different aspects uh, in hematology. He would have viewed his greatest accomplishments as his trainees. I think he, not only the people that he trained here at Mount Sinai, but he, through this Polycythemia Vera study group, he influenced the careers of multiple other investigators, nurtured their careers, gave them an opportunity to participate in various aspects of, this, of these studies. And in reality, many of these people, they were his students and their careers were advanced um, through his assistance. I spent a year with uh, Dr. Max Wintrobe, who's a hematologist. And at that time, uh, George Cartwright was his associate. And I could say for a year, I had a, a very good mentor in terms of hematology and dealing with patients and occasionally going skiing at Alta. 
he, I think he first realized that when you put a tube of blood on the, you stand it up on the table, the red cells gradually fall down. And that became the erythrocyte sed rate and a very useful technique for following patients with certain kinds of diseases. At the New England Medical Center, where Damashek was the head of hematology, there was a distinguished uh, physician who had escaped from Germany in the late 1930s by the name of Siegfried Tannhauser. Tannhauser was a friend of Henry Stratton. Henry Stratton was also a refugee from uh, Nazi Germany, escaped in the late 1930s, and started a publishing house called Grun and Stratton. Stratton was interested in um, starting a journal about hematology because the then standard journal, uh, which was published in Europe and was called Folia Hematologica, went out of business. Tannhauser told him, you better speak to Bill Damaschek about this. And they got together and Bill said yes. Stratton proposed the title of the journal, Blood, which Damaschek accepted. The journal started in 1946. It became the official journal of the American Society of Hematology in 1976. Ernie Jaffe was a wonderful man, I thought, and he really just took over and made that journal sparkle. One of the things that we can all say about the journal is that, to my knowledge, every, under the, under the tenure of every editor, the scientific impact of the journal has continued to go up. And that's a direct reflection of the quality of the science that's published in the journal. I felt it was very important to give the practicing hematologist more of a stake in the society. For a long time, ASH didn't have much to say to practitioners. There hadn't been much change in the approach to many diseases for 20 or 30 years. And then suddenly, we had the advent of new therapies, which took advantage of molecular understanding of the diseases and targets that had been identified that were tested in phase three trials that were licensed and soon identified as tremendously important in changing the lives of people with those illnesses. So we went from having little to teach the practitioner to being a major source of innovation. The very fact that just the plain practicing doctor became president of an organization of this qua, this stature was very exciting. It was somewhat unique to have a private practitioner. It was unique in hematology completely, but in general medicine, un unusual to have somebody in practice. I, I was at a session of ASH, and there was a business meeting. And this was a small organization then, and the president said, is there anything else that anybody from the audience wants to bring up? And someone raises his hand. Yes, sir. You know, for us practicing physicians, why isn't there an education program at ASH? And you know, the next year there was. And I thought, this is a good organization. When they see something that has to be done, they do it. There's not a lot of fuss. In 1983, Henry Stratton called me one day and said he wanted to do something with the society uh, that would continue uh, the programs. What, did it, what, what could the society do with a quarter million dollars? And I said, Henry, the best thing that they could, you could do is to give them money for research training of fellows. And in my view, this is what began the whole program of, of funding research fellows, postdoctoral fellows in hematology, and which has now come to be a very large part of the society's operations. I tried during my presidency to, to, to focus on training. That's been my great interest, is to developing new young people. And I gave my talk on that topic, and I wanted ASH to be better about the, to help training. Of course, we didn't have any money at that time to do that. But now, I think ASH is really doing a great job on helping training. They have a lot of grants for young people and, and uh, opportunities for learning that we didn't have at the time. So I think we're doing very well with that. 
I think the important part of the society is that young people see it as a place to develop their own careers, to participate and to contribute and to continue to be active once they've achieved independence and success. Ash was a pioneer to start, it was a pioneer, to start the educational program. And we have this Wasserman lecture because Wasserman was one of the presidents who set up this the educational program. And the educational program is tremendous again. And people are coming all over the world, the clinicians are coming to this meeting in order to be benefited from the educational program. And I noticed early on with those improvements that it wasn't just the practitioners who were going to them. A lot of people who were full professors in universities were actually sneaking into those programs. They were very good. So 50 years ago, clotting factors weren't even known. I mean, it was known that blood clotted, but the specific factors weren't known. And in this, in this subsequent 50 years, all these proteins have been isolated, their genes have been cloned, many new proteins have been found, inhibitors of coagulation were discovered. In the 50s, hematology didn't exist as a separate specialist. The first event was really the hemoglobin because that was the first a protein, because there's so much of it, that was really available for study back in the, in the 50s and 60s when I was starting out. And I made some substantial contributions to the hemoglobin field. You know, I was the one who showed that thalassemia is, is due to, to really an imbalance of protein synthesis. And that's a, become a common problem. That's the problem in Parkinson's disease and in Alzheimer's disease. A whole bunch of, of disorders are related to proteins that don't have any partners to dance with. In 1972, I discovered the E21 translocation, which was the very first one in acute myeloid leukemia, and then about six months later discovered the 922 in CML. You know, using the translocations themselves to diagnose and classify various forms of leukemia and lymphoma, and of course now it's, uh, it's useful in solid tumors. Uh, as well, so that's an important uh, component. But then as we began to understand what genes were translocation breakpoints uh, and how the genes were altered as a consequence of the translocation, this has led to uh, the development of, of very critical therapies, Gleevec being the most obvious uh, example in uh, CML. I think probably one of the most amazing people is Don Thomas, who is the person who really started bone marrow transplants. And just before I came to the Brigham, he had, was basically uh, asked to leave because people didn't think what he was working on was going to amount to much. And he received the Nobel Prize for very original and innovative research he did, but he also I think received the credit for courageous work because no one believed that a bone marrow transplant would work in those days and really cure patients. My interest was general until 1955 when there was a paper published in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute by people named Maine and Prain and they showed that an animal given a, uh, an infusion of bone marrow from a different strain of mouse would subsequently accept, accept that a skin graft from that uh, donor strain but not from any other mouse. And uh, you know in the classical sense the light bulb went on and, uh, but the, the meaning of that was that the immunology of that mouse that had a marrow transplant uh, had been changed radically. And uh, the thought was that uh, if we could do that in a mouse, uh, we might be able to do that in a man. Patients with acute leukemia almost always died within one or two years. And Don Thomas had shown that if he transplanted those patients when they were not in too bad condition, that about 20% of them seemed to survive. Now the difference between zero and 20 is pretty big. And it must have it took him probably 20 years to get this technique to work 
and, and now it's really revolutionized hematology. He won the Nobel Prize for it, and I think there's a lot to be learned from people who have a vision and refuse to quit. You know, they're just going to do it no matter what. I uh, set up a marrow transplantation program at the City of Hope in 1974, and we started transplanting patients in complete remission. The long-term survival rate was nearly 80%. I've seen uh, the structure of the of hemoglobin elucidated, the structure of the red cell membrane completely worked out, uh, all the the, the structure of all the coagulation proteins, none of which was known when I started in this field. And then there's been this explosion in hematopoiesis. So we now understand in pretty good detail how the bone marrow works, how you can grow cells. The kind of, uh, the whole concept of the stem cell came from work on the blood. And I think it's starting to help patients. So we now are much better at treating a lot of blood disorders. We have recombinant proteins to give people with factor deficiencies. We have targeted therapies to give people with various kinds of blood cell malignancies, leukemias and lymphomas. In early December, late November of 1985, we gave the first world, the first ever recombinant EPO to a human being who had renal failure. And uh, there were a lot of hoops to go through in terms of the FDA and trial design. But in the spring of, two th in the spring of 1986, uh, we began to see our first real responses in terms of increased red cell production, hematocrit going up, transfusion needs were eliminated. Well, I think the most significant milestone was Linus Pauling's discovery that sickle cell anemia was due to a single substitution of amino acids in the structure of hemoglobin. And this recognition that a one small molecular change could result in a serious illness uh, was the introduction to molecular hematology. For many years I've studied the mechanism by which platelets stick to blood vessels and there's a particular protein called the von Willebrand's protein that acts as the kind of glue that holds platelets to the vessel wall. And our lab helped uh, clone the gene that encodes the von Willebrand's protein, worked out the structure, the binding sites that interact with the vessel and the vessel wall, made crystals of the, of the protein to study them. So we've done a lot of interesting work on von Willebrand's factor and the, dis the, the bleeding disorder that occurs when you don't make this protein normally. I worked in, uh, in Dr. Mustard's lab laboratory when he made the observation that aspirin um, uh, slowed down the ability of blood platelets to clump. And actually I did the first clinical trial of, of uh, low-dose aspirin to prevent thrombosis. The way we figured it out was that aspirin, if you look at the structure of aspirin, it's a mixed anhydride of acetic acid and salicylic acid. And in general, anhydrides are very reactive compounds. They'll add to amino groups of proteins just in a flash with no enzyme or anything else needed. So I looked at aspirin and I thought, this must be a reactive compound. It must react with something. And the fellow who was working on this uh, his name is Jerry Roth. He's the head of the hematology at the Seattle VA Hospital now. Uh, Jerry decided he'd add it to platelets, and just intact platelets, and bingo. We had the answer in a couple of days. And there was another test called the thromboplasin generation test that you could use, but it took about an hour of a technician's time to run. I said, we need a simple, quick test and I know how to get it. We can take this partial thromboplastin time, which wasn't any good for general use because you, the numbers you got depended on whether you had a new test tube or how you washed a glass test tube or something like that. We can fix that. The tests that I developed with my fellow uh, was, uh, is used now in clinical laboratories and hospitals and elsewhere all over the world and it's been used for 50 years. And. Uh, it uh, makes me feel good because it makes it possible to uh, 
quickly decide if you're going to take a patient to surgery, you have to be careful they might bleed too much, or you have to be careful they might clot too much. And, uh, and you could sort of tell that from the number you got from this simple test. And we basically set the criteria for the diagnosis and treatment of polycythemia vera that have stood up over the years and is uh, even the latest textbook, the original criteria are still there. I, mean, I started out at the NCI on childhood leukemia where there were no survivors, not at all. I never expected to salvage a patient with with uh, leukemia. There was no way to do that. And today, my fellows cry if they lose one child with, with leukemia. We, we're curing 80, 85 percent of them. You know, chronic myeloid leukemia is another example where a targeted drug now can be used to really control the disease for extended periods of time. So there really truly have been dramatic improvements in outcome, clinical outcome, in many of the blood disorders. That's a new avenue in chemotherapy that is not going to be just confined to the leukemias, but it will also, I think, apply in other, in other oncologic diseases and in other diseases, like other diseases that are immunologic, for example. I think the whole a <coughs> HIV story is extraordinary. When you think that, you know, if that virus had come 10 or 15 years earlier, it would have changed the history of the human race. But the fact that it came just at the time we developed the methodology to actually define it, discover it, create antibodies for it so we can make assays and so forth. I think that's truly a remarkable story of biomedical research. A lot of things have changed. We have genomics, we have better diagnosis, we have uh, immunophenotyping. We can really distinguish. And now we have not only AML, acute myeloleukemia versus acute lymphoblastic leukemia, but we have all kinds of subtypes that we can recognize. So the field has profoundly changed in terms of diagnostics, in terms of therapeutics. Cardiology does stents, angioplasty, coronary bypass. None of these operations would be possible without the discoveries of hematologists who found thrombin receptors, ADP receptors, antagonists for those receptors, and you couldn't do this coronary stenting without those inhibitors, the blood, they would clot immediately. Now, hematology has been the leader in molecular medicine. Uh, the first uh, demonstration of a molecular disease, sickle cell anemia. Uh, hematology has been a leader in the treatment of malignant disease. Uh, and it's been a leader in uh, virtually all aspects of uh, clinical investigative medicine. You know, few of us are really privileged to, to do something that's, that's going to make a difference for some people. Probably there were 50 or 100 people who came to the first meeting. When I went to my first meeting in the 70s, which was in uh, Hollywood, Florida, there were about 2,000 people there. So it's grown from 2,000 to 22,000 in the time that I've been, been coming to these meetings. Nowadays, the constituency of ASH is to a large part international. There's a significant international membership, and there are many uh, contributors to uh, the, the Blood Journal. Uh, there are international members on the board, and there are many international members attending the meetings. And that's the highlight of this meeting here. I mean, the program is wonderful, but interaction with colleagues who, with whom you can discuss crucial topics. Uh, for instance, you have a certain disease, let's say something obvious like multiple myeloma, and you read something new about it. At the, in at the meeting, you have a good chance to run into the guy at the, that wrote the article when you talk about him. It's that kind of thing. It's an opportunity to get together on a one-to-one -one basis and discuss the problems that face us. Um, problems in funding, problems in science, problems in clinical medicine. And there's really no substitute for that. Um, no matter how good the electronic media become, no matter how inexpensive it is to have a telephone conference, there's nothing like uh, sitting down at a little table at a meeting with a colleague and um, discussing what you think about how chronic lymphocytic leukemia should be addressed in the future. 
despite the name American society, it's an international society. People come from all over the world to attend the annual meeting in December. Uh, it's had an enormous um, impact in providing an opportunity for young people to show what they're doing. The Arts Center is the International Society of uh, Hematology. I think that uh, 20 or 30 percent even more of the participants are from overseas. Today in the plenary session, more than half of the papers are from overseas. This is fantastic. I mean, uh, it's extremely positive development. It is very appreciated also around the world. I mean, the hematologists uh, uh, in Europe, for example, they are looking forward for this meeting and to come and then meet with their uh, colleagues and also uh, uh, learn from the uh, fantastic program. This is a tremendous thing. Of, uh, the program of these meetings is outstanding, always. If you look at a given meeting, half of the people at the meeting are from other countries and it functions more like an international society and is starting to do things in the international arena by cooperating with other societies or doing, doing uh, projects. So it is probably the leading voice for hematology in the world. Why is ASH so successful? Why is the meeting so successful? Because it gets the right things right and that is excellence in the education program. It picks the best science to be presented. It brings the leaders of the field together. It is both timely and timeless. And, and, and the, the timely part is, I think, the new generations of ASH, where we have forums on topical issues. That wasn't true in the old days because we didn't have the same kind of issues. I think the major problem that hematology faces is it's rec being recognized as a discipline within internal medicine. And this was improved considerably when uh, Dr. Maxwell Wintrow, working with John Gruppenhoff, who used to be employed by the society, convinced the NIH to add blood to the name of the National Heart and Lung Institute, so it became the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And that, I think, has been very helpful in making hematology somewhat more visible than it was before. When we got more organized, we began to invite people to come to us at the annual meeting to talk to us about issues and how to confront them, how to write letters, how to be involved and responsive when legislation arose. We were assisted by email and other ways of communicating so we could be much more effective and responsive and I think we did make a difference. ASH is the society. It, and the reason for it is because there are so many good um, clinician scientists and basic scientists in hematology. ASH has really been central to the development of the field of hematology. Uh, I think not only through publications such as Blood, uh, but I think that the, that the annual meeting has people, look at the number of PhDs who come to ASH. Look at the number of people from foreign countries who come. I think the special feature about ASH is that it brings together hematology in its full broadness. It covers the different sub-disciplines of hematology, coagulation, transfusion medicine, benign hematology, malignant hematology, and also some basic research. And this is very special. I think that ASH has tried uh, to uh, serve all masters, if you will, in terms of having a diverse program. Uh, and so that uh, there is a lot that keeps basic scientists returning because of the high scientific quality uh, at the same time also uh, for the practicing physician uh, tries to be extremely current on the best treatment for the various sorts of uh, both malignant and non-malignant disorders. The American Society of Hematology really does some very good things in terms of encouraging young people to get 
training in the field of science. I think the great thing about ASH is the integrity of the society, um, the intent to do the right thing, um, the funneling of resources to uh, expand research. You can have a journal, that's great. Have an annual meeting, that's great. But now there are all kinds of other activities to help people enter the field, to provide funds for training young scholars, to, um, uh, to do some lobbying and consciousness raising with Congress. I mean, there's sort of a whole variety of activities. So the, the society functions as the sort of guild, if you will, for people interested in hematology and as the scientific uh, clearinghouse and, 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 and forum for, for presenting work in the field. Research in hematology has never been more promising we are able now to uh, imagine targeted therapies for uh, diseases for which we may have effective therapies for only 20% of the people diagnosed with the usual classification of the disease. For that, we need young investigators full of hope and enthusiasm and willing to work on those problems. I don't think there's another area of medicine that has more promise. You know, I think we're not at the center of our knowledge of, of blood and, and blood cells, blood vessels. I think we're at the edge of it. And there, there will be more excitement in the research field. And that's why it's important not to abandon the fact that medicine is aimed at, at human disease. Why should young people go into hematology? Because there has never been more hope for people with diseases that used to be considered uniformly fatal. One could envision having hemoglobin made, for example. Go, you could buy a bottle of hemoglobin if you needed it. And we've got some very powerful drugs. And these drugs have been developed um, really at, like the proverbial ma magic bullet. The target uh, can be, um, is um, the target molecule can be crystallized, uh, the structure is completely understood, the technology there and structured chemi chemistry is there to be able to sort of put a, put a key into a lock. All this is there. In the field of hemostasis, and particularly in the field of anticoagulants, there is a new wave of um, inhibitors of the coagulation system which will replace what we have now. No more prothrombin times will uh, be required. Uh, no more uh, uh, regular testing uh, to control the dose of uh, Coumadin. It will all be oral medication, no lab um, uh, tests required, and probably more effective than what we have now. In the last 20 years, we also worked very hard to develop gene therapy approaches where we can actually introduce genes into bone marrow stem cells to try to correct the disease. And uh, we've made a lot of progress. We're beginning to plan our initial clinical trial now. To date, it's all been in animal systems and uh, experimental systems. But we believe that the vectors are sufficiently advanced now to consider clinical application. I think the field of hematology is absolutely booming. There's so many developments ongoing. Uh, in basic research, in clinical research, and the interaction between those. And every year there are surprises and excitements, and this makes it uh, a wonderful life to work in this field.